Today, we are going to talk about the history of the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement. Our church should be examined from three standpoints. Doctrine, history, and prophecy. And today, we are going to talk about our history. Before we enter directly in our history, we want to review a little bit our past history. The history of the Seventh-day Advent movement. Seventh-day Adventists inherited from Protestants a very important doctrine and that was righteousness by faith. However, that message, Christ our righteousness, that was preached already in time of Martin Luther was proclaimed as righteousness without obedience. When Seventh-day Adventists came into existence, they found out that the Ten Commandments is binding. And now they had to preach to all churches the law of God that is binding. And they were preaching the law. They were publishing arguments in their publications showing that the law is binding and was not abolished on the cross. And also that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment of God's law is binding. And that was one of the important theme that they preached and they taught in writing and in sermons. You can uh, look to the early publications of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and you will find that in the very first issue called The Present Truth, there was an article published by James White about the Ten Commandments entitled The Law Originated in Eden, Not at Sinai. And they were preaching the law of God so much that they forgot to preach Christ and His righteousness. They preached the law so much that they became exhausted. And according to the words of the Spirit of Prophecy, they became destitute of dew of heaven and in 1888 God sent a precious message to the church and that was the message Christ our righteousness and when they began to preach Christ our righteousness and that message was brought to the General Conference of Minneapolis, Minnesota in November 1888. There were strong reaction against that message from the part of the main leaders and they were opposing that message. 
And what they were saying is that they do not need to preach so much righteousness by faith. They thought that they are going back to Protestantism. And in Review and Herald, March 11, 1890, this is what we read. Brethren, shall we not all of us leave our loads there? And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law as a people we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eye self. We must draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to us if we come in His own appointed way. Oh, that you may go forth as the disciples did after the day of Pentecost. And then your testimony will have a living ring and souls will be converted to God. They were preaching the law until they became dry as Mount of Gilboa. And they said, we don't need to preach Christ our righteousness. We let us preach the law. But the Spirit of Prophet says, let us preach Christ in the law. Anyway, according to Testimonies to Ministers, pages 79, 80, 91, 92, and pages 107, 401, all these pages say that the message Christ our righteousness was rejected by those that held positions of trust. I would like to mention names of, of two main leaders that have rejected the message Christ our righteousness. I do not want to mention others, but I will mention the names of two. One of them was Uriah Smith. Yes, Uriah Smith, he opposed the message Christ our righteousness in 1888. And the other one was Louis Conradi. And both men were present at the General Conference session in 1888. But what happened to these two men after that conference? Uriah Smith, he repented and he accepted the message after the conference. And I want to read this from Manuscript Releases, Book 2, pages 6 and 7. Manuscript Releases, Book 2, 
page 6 and 7. Yesterday, Wednesday, the meeting was held in my room in the office and Elder Smith read the letter I had sent him, read it to them all and said he accepted it as from God. He went back to the Minneapolis meeting and made a confession of the spirit he had occupied, casting on me very heavy burdens. Brother Rupert confessed also, and we had a very profitable, excellent meeting. Brother Smith has fallen on the rock and is broken, and the Lord Jesus will now work with him. He took my hand as he left the room and said, If the Lord will forgive me, for the sorrow and burdens I have brought upon you, I tell you, this will be the last. I will stay up your hands. The testimonies of God shall hold this place in my experience. It is seldom that Elder Smith sheds a tear, but he did weep, and his voice was choked with the tears in it. Now, you see, I have reason to be glad and rejoice and praise the Lord. Professor Bell was present. Elder Smith confessed to him the wrong that he had done to him in the school trial in 1882. Oh, how glad I was to see and hear and know that these things that had barred the Spirit of God from coming into our meetings were removed. Uriah Smith, he confessed that he acted wrongly at Minneapolis. And the Spirit of Prophecy says that Uriah Smith had fallen upon the rock. And he accepted the testimonies. Ellen White supported the message presented by elders Wagner and Jones. And Uriah Smith now supported that message also. However, Elder Conradi did not take that step. He continued against the message, Christ, our righteousness, presented by Wagner and Jones. And because El, Ellen White was supporting that message, Conradi rose up against Ellen White and against the spirit of prophecy. This is recorded in the book of Leroy Froome, the Movement of Destiny, page 677. Conradi did not believe in the spirit of prophecy. And for that reason, in Europe, where he was the president of the division, the testimonies for the church were never published. The nine volumes testimonies for the church in Europe were never published in any language by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, especially in the time of Conradi. In 1912, the Seventh-day Adventist published a Sabbath school lesson, a quarterly, about the Ten Commandments. And in that lesson, the believers have studied the need 
of obedience to the Ten Commandments. That lesson was published in Europe in the year 1913. And I remember my father telling us that when he accepted Adventism, he was studying that lesson about the Ten Commandments. And he was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1913. I can keep in my mind the date of his baptism, which was February 13, 1913. And this date is very important to me because I also was baptized on February 13, but in 1948. And they were teaching the law. Ellen White has sent a message to the General Conference in 1913 and this is what she mentioned in her letter. This is taken from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 403. We are to raise the banner on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Obedience to God's law is the great issue. Let it not be put out of sight. We must strive to arouse church members and those who make no profession to see and obey the claims of the law of heaven. We are to magnify this law and make it honorable. This was a message in one of the two letters that Ellen White sent to the General Conference assembled in 1913. In testimonies to ministers, in the other letter, she says the following on page 514. It will be well for us to consider what is soon to come upon the earth. This is not time for trifling or self-seeking. If the times in which we are living fail to impress our minds seriously, what can reach us? Do not the scriptures call for a more pure and holy work that we have yet seen? Men of clear understanding are needed now. God calls upon those who are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to lead out in a work of thorough reformation. I see a crisis before us and the Lord calls for His laborers to come into line. Every soul should now stand in a position of deeper, truer consecration to God than during the years that have passed. This was Ellen White's last message to the church in 1913 and in this message she mentioned that there was a crisis before the church soon something very important will come upon the earth and God calls those that are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to lead out in a work of thorough reformation. As I mentioned before, the law of God was preached until 1888 and even after 1888 
the law was preached and God now tested his people exactly on that point of the law. And Ellen White says, the ob obedience to God's law is the great issue. Now what happened the following year? In 1914, World War I broke out. And the following circular letter was sent out by the European Division to all Seventh-day Adventists, signed by the Secretary of the Division, Elder Guy Dale. And I read this letter, circular letter, that was sent out on August 2nd, 1914. To our dear brethren and sisters, greetings with Psalms 23. In this earnest and terrible time into which Europe has fallen, we desire to request the following of you. One, as followers of Christ, through the power of God, we should in these days be true, obedient, and subject to the services of our land. Two, we should do our military duties joyfully whilst we are in service or being called to serve, so that the officers in charge will find in us valiant and true soldiers who are ready to die for their homes, for our army and our fatherland. Our destiny is in God's hand. Should we lose our life Whilst in conflict, let us remember that our life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3.8 3. Those who are left at home should prove to their neighbors that they are noble-minded and filled with the love of Christ, ready to help in every way possible to relieve the suffering and the sick, the wounded, the poor, the widows and the orphans. We dare not lose our courage, but be patient in affliction, doing as Moses, whose song we expect to sing someday. Trust on him, as seeing him who is invisible. Let us not forget to earnestly search the word of God. Visit our meeting regularly, and above all things, when you come before the throne of grace, do not forget to pray for our government and our army. 1 Timothy 2.2 2. 4. We must always remember our mission as messengers of Christ, and according to our strength, serve to save souls. Committing you all to the grace of God, I am, with heartfelt salutation, your brother in the Lord, signed, Elder G. Dale, Secretary, European Division. When Seventh-day Adventists received this letter, they were perplexed and they did not know now what to do. Let me open here a parenthesis and tell the experience of my own father. As an Adventist in 1914, a new member of the church, he had studied 
the Ten Commandments in the Sabbath school lesson the previous year. And when he received the order that they should do military service, take part in the war, he was perplexed, did not know what to do. And because he wanted to be faithful member of the church, he went in the army and entered in war service. He told us that his work was to carry food from the kitchen to the soldiers. And he became sick, physically sick. The officer sent him home for treatment. And while he was having his treatment at home, one elder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church convinced him that Seventh-day Adventists cannot take part in the war. And so my father, who already had studied the validity of God's law, was convinced, and so he did not return to the army. And because he did not return to the army, he was disfellowshipped from the church. That was the experience of my own father. My mother was baptized in 1916 in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And immediately after her baptism, they had the first meeting where they should have the Lord's Supper. And the minister asked, how many of you are in favor of brother so-and-so, which was the elder of the church? And that brother stood up and he said, it's not on my side, it's on the side of the Lord. But the minister insisted, asking, who is on his side with the same idea of that brother? Because the elder of the church, he was of the opinion that we should not take part in the war. So when the minister insisted, about 20 people stood up, and among them, my own mother stood up. She was still young. And then the minister said, you cannot take part in the Lord's Supper today, because you are on the side of this brother. Together with my mother, there was another young sister, a little bit older than my mother, by name Rosa. And she is still alive today. She lives in Romania. In 1995, I was in Romania and I went to visit her personally. And she told me that she and my mother were very good friends and they both were disfellowshipped from the church that very Sabbath when they were not permitted to take part in the Lord's Supper. So I took a photo with me and her. And that photo will be published in our book entitled The History of the Reform Movement. And there is the documentary photograph that I took of this sister who is still alive. She was this fellowship together with my mother in 1916. Many 
Seventh-day Adventist brethren, they do not know what happened during World War I. I want to read a statement from volume 10 of Bible Commentary, and this is Encyclopedia, on page 1332, under the title, SDA Reform Movement. And here, Seventh-day Adventists, they publish something which is true, and they publish something which is not true. And we will show which part is true and which is not true. And I read here, on the German mobilization in August 1914, the SDAs of that country were faced with the necessity of making an immediate decision concerning their duty to God and country when called into the armed forces. Notice what they say here. The leaders in Germany, they had to make a decision what to do when they were called to the army. No, they did not have to make any decision because the decision has been made already from the very beginning. We have presented already in the video combatancy or conscientious objectors. We have presented those evidences that the Seventh-day Adventists, they pledged themselves in 1861 to be faithful to the commandments of God. And in 1864, during the Civil War, they sent a message to the Minister of War stating that in the army service they cannot obey both the officers and God because the fourth and the sixth commandments cannot be kept. So in 1914, they, don't, they did not need to make any decision because the decision had already been made. The historical position of Adventist Church was there. And they published that position in the book, Seventh-day Adventist in Time of War, page 58. Now, I read further in this commentary of the encyclopedia. After counseling with a few SDA leaders locally available at that time, the president of the Eastern German Union Conference informed the German War Ministry in writing, dated August 4, 1914, that conscripted SDAs would bear arms as combatants and would render service on the Sabbath in defense of their country. Now this statement is made by the Seventh-day Adventist Church in their book, volume 10 of Bible Commentary, which is the encyclopedia. They recognized that they sent Seventh-day Adventists as combatants to take part in the war and render service on the Sabbath in defense of their country. And on the next page, they admit that this position was contrary to the original position. Let me read. They say, Admittedly, the three SDA leaders in Germany took a stand concerning the duty of SDAs in military service, 
that was contrary to the historic stand officially maintained by the denomination ever since the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865. They admit that they took a stand that was contrary to the historical stand officially maintained by the denomination. They admit that. And this really happened. But I mentioned that there is something they say here which is not true. They say here on page 1332, though the original issue was over visions and time setting, the bone of contention through the years has been the stand taken by the SDA Church concerning the duty of its members in military service. While it is true that the bone of contention has been the military question, it is not true that the reform movement originated with visions and time setting. And they here mention the name of one man by name Vic. They say one man, John Vic, drafted into the German army proved to be an extremist, claiming to have been shown in vision that probation for all men would end in the spring. Several other persons also made time-setting predictions. These alleged prophets denounced the SDA leaders for not giving credence to their predictions and for refusing to publish them. One name here is mentioned, Vic, John Vic. And they say that he had vision with all fairness and in defense of truth. We must state that this John Vick was never a member of the Reform Movement. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he was never accepted in the Reform Movement as a member. In 1920, when Elder Daniels was in Europe, and they discussed the question of the war with the representatives of those who were disfellowshipped, many documents were presented and I read now the words of Elder Daniels, which was published in a book called Protocol. About this book, we will talk a little bit later. But I just want to read this part about Vic. And here are the words of Elder Daniels. These here are the documents which have been handed to us by Brother Conradi. They are to show how matters stand with this movement. We can pick out those which you do not consider belonging to your movement. The first writing is by Vic, and the answer of E. Dershler was, which was representing those that were disfellowshipped, he said, he did not belong to this movement. So Elder Daniels knew clearly that Vic never belonged to the Reform Movement. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if he had a vision, 
It was the problem of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He never belonged to the Reform Movement. But now, coming back to this question, when those that opposed taking part in a war were disfellowshipped, the believers in Europe did not know what was taking place in other countries. There was no communication between countries during wartime. The letter that the President of German Union sent to the Ministry of War on August 14, 1914, I have it here and I am going to read this letter written to the Ministry of War that the President of the German Union sent. President of German Union was H. F. Schubert. He says, Most Honorable Lord General and Minister of War, since of times our point of view concerning our duty towards the government, also our position in general military duty, and especially since our refusal to serve in time of peace on Saturday, Sabbath, is regarded as fanatical, therefore I take the liberty, Your Excellency, to present to you in the following the principles of the German Seventh-day Adventists, especially just now in the present war situation while we stand on the foundation of the Holy Scriptures, we seek to fulfill the precepts of Christendom, keeping the rest day, Saturday, that God established in the beginning by endeavoring to put aside all work on that day. Still, in time of stress, we have bound ourselves together in defense of the Fatherland and under these circumstances, we will also bear arms on Saturday, Sabbath. On this point, we take our stand on the scriptures found in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Fear God, honor the king. We have given these resolutions to our members, also asking them to organize prayer meetings to petition God to give the victory to the German arms. Should some among the drafted Adventists refuse to serve on the Sabbath or object to the bearing of arms, we will be grateful, Your Excellency, if the then commanding officer has a knowledge of our principles or resolutions. In connection herewith, allow me, Your Excellency, to inform you that in Friedensau, Magdeburg, our sanitarium, our mission school, also 250 pitched tents, with a physician in charge, and a number of trained nurses, who will be able to care for about 1,400 wounded soldiers, will be placed at your disposal, with prayer that God will will give this righteous cause the victory, I have the honor, Your Excellency, to remain signed H. F. Schubert, President of German Union. This letter sent to the Minister of War states clearly that under the circumstances of the war, 
they instructed all the members to take part in the war and bear arms also on the Sabbath day as combatants. No wonder that the uh, members of the church, they were perplexed. And many of them did not know what to do. And there were protests. Many have protested against this attitude of the German Union. So they published a letter in November 15, 1917. And the title of this letter is An Explanation. And in this letter, which I'm not going to read because it's two and a half pages of this book, they justify themselves using Bible verses that they should submit themselves to the government. And this letter ratifies the action of the German Union and of the European Division. And who signed this letter? The committees of East and West German Union, European Central Union, the Danubian Union of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But as if this would not be sufficient, they published a little booklet called The Christian and the War. And in that book, The Christian and the War, published in Germany, on page 18, they say, in all that we have said, we have shown that the Bible teaches, firstly, that taking part in war is not a transgression of the Sixth Commandment. Secondly, that war service on the Sabbath is not a transgression of the Fourth Commandment. He who believes otherwise let him show one declaration of the scriptures or the testimony. If he is not able to do so, let him be careful that he should not bring accusations and statements which he cannot prove. Did you notice here that they state that taking part in war is not transgression of the Sixth Commandment, and doing war service on the Sabbath is not transgression of the fourth commandment. Let us compare this statement here with what they have stated in 1864. In 1864, the Seventh-day Adventists declared this, and I'm quoting from the book, Seventh-day Adventists in Time of War, by Elder Wilcox. They say, if there is any portion of the Bible which we as a people can point to more than another as our creed, it is the law of the Ten Commandments, which we regard as the supreme law, and each precept of which we take in its most obvious and literal import. The fourth of these commandments requires cessation from labor on the seventh day of the week. The sixth prohibits the taking of life, 
neither of which in our view could be observed while doing military duty. The fourth and sixth commandment could not be kept according to the historical stand of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1864. But in 1916, they declared that taking part in war is not a transgression of the Sixth Commandment and doing war service on the Sabbath is not a transgression of the Fourth Commandment. A completely new position, contrary to the official original position. When the believers were disfellowshipped from the church because they would not take part in the war, and this did not happen only in Germany. My parents were in Hungary. There happened exactly what happened in Germany. And it happened in about 16 countries in Europe. About 4,000 members of the church were disfellowshipped from the church because of their obedience to the commandments of God, is specifically the fourth and sixth commandments. When the war was over, In 1918, the armistice was signed. Those that were disfellowshipped, they made special effort to reconcile their position with the church. But it was of no avail. There was no possibility of reconciliation. Then, the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists from Washington, D.C., sent to Europe four members of the General Conference Committee. And they were Elders A. G. Daniels, which was the president, L. H. Christian, F. M. Wilcox, the man who wrote this book, Seventh-day Adventists in Time of War, and M. E. Kern. They were sent to Europe in 1920. And they had an interview with those that were disfellowshipped from the church. This interview was held from July 21st to 23rd, 1920, in the Missionary School of the Seventh day Adventists in Friedensau, Germany. The proceeds of that meeting or whatever was spoken in that meeting was taken by an stenographer. And then the Seventh-day Adventist published the minutes of that meeting under the title protocol and that was in German language. The Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement later translated this very book, Protocol, and kept that title, Protocol, and we translated it into Spanish and English. When we were just about to publish it in English, we had an interview with elder, one elder of the Adventist Church. I will not mention his name. 
and he gave us a copy of the very minutes already translated into English. And we have that very copy in our files, in our headquarters. Now, in this book, Protocol, there was a meeting between those representatives of the General Conference, some officers of the European Union, uh, European Division, and representatives of those that were disfellowshipped. Those that were disfellowshipped were known by different names or titles. They were known as the movement of the opposition. They were known also as the 2%. Now, that they were this fellowship from the church is documented. And I want to read what the Seventh-day Adventist published about the disfellowshipment of the faithful who did not take part in the war. This, what I'm going to read, was published in a newspaper called Dresden Neueste Nachrichten on the 12th of April 1918, page 3. And notice what the Adventists declared through that paper. At the beginning of the war, our organization divided into two parts. Whilst 98% of our members stepped out after searching the Bible on the ground that it was our conscientious duty to defend the fatherland with weapons and that also on the Sabbath and this decided position from the United Leaders was at once forwarded to the War Department. Two percent, however, did not submit themselves to this decision of the leaders and therefore had to be disfellowshipped because of their anti-Christian conduct. These unprofitable elements set themselves up as preachers and with little results sought to make converts to their propaganda of foolish ideas. They call themselves falsely preachers and Adventists. They are not. They are deceivers. When such elements receive their merited punishment, we regard it, in fact, a favor done toward us. Our leaders have, up to this day, allowed our surplus church money to be used up in war loans in the fullest assurance that Germany, with God's help, would come through this terrible struggle victorious. Everywhere our members are sharing the self-evident duty in giving into the hands of the fatherland the so much needed means. The Adventist men are practically all in the field or army service and are awaiting a just treatment and also the thanks of the fatherland. This was declared by the Seventh-day Adventists in the newspaper in Germany, April 12, 1918. In the same year, another declaration was made, this time in Stuttgarter Neues Tageblatt, September 26, 1918. And they declare, in the beginning of the war, there were some members, as there are also in other places, who did not want to take part in war service. 
either because of their lack of unity or because of fanaticism. They started to spread around their ideas in the congregation by word and by writing, trying to convince others to do the same. They were exhorted, warned by the church, but because of their obstinacy, they had to be put out, for they became a threatening to internal and external peace. Previous to this declaration, the German paper, Kölnische Zeitung, the evening edition, September 21, 1915, the newspaper have declared the following. Since the beginning of the war, there has been a division among the Adventist people. During the duration of the war, the majority wanted to see the funda fundamental teachings set aside by force if necessary. The others ask that the sanctification of Saturday, Sabbath, be allowed them even in these times of stress. The opposing faction finally brought about the disfellowshipment from the organization of the followers of the original principles of their faith. And later, in 1936, the president of the General Conference, Elder C. H. Watson, he sent out a circular letter entitled the European situation and in point eight of his circular letter he says there was in Germany and those other countries concerned a minority of our believers who refused to follow the leadership of Conradi and others into combatant participation in the war and in the last part of point 10 of his circular letter he says the resistance of the minority to military service threatened to compromise the whole body of Adventists in the eyes of the German government and to avoid this Conradi had the minority disfellowship from the church it is documented that the faithful were disfellowshipped from the church. Now let us go back to 1920, to that meeting in Friedensau. The representatives of those that were disfellowshipped put for question to the leading brethren. And I will read these four questions. Question number one. What position does the General Conference take concerning the decision which was made by the German leaders since 1914 in regard to the Fourth and Sixth Commandments? The following documents may serve as evidences for our discussion. The document to the War Ministry from the German Union then the document by Brother Dale in Hamburg, then the tract The Christian and the War by Brother Vincent in Berlin, then the explanation which appeared in a newspaper, Berliner Lokalanzeiger, from the Seventh-day Adventist leadership, then a document for clarification published by the leadership. This is... The first point, what attitude does the General Conference take in regard to these documents that were published? And what do these documents say? They say that Advent should do military service and that is not transgression of the, of the Sixth and Fourth Commandment. Now the second question, what proof can be shown as 
that we have not taken the biblical course toward the brethren, a reproach which was brought against us in the last Zion's watchman. Point number three. What position does the General Conference of the American Brethren take towards the testimonies of Sister White today? Firstly, are they inspired by God or not? Secondly, should we continue to proclaim health reform, which she brought to us as the right arm of the message or not? Point number four. Is our message, according to Revelation 14, 6 to 12, national or international? We have here various numbers of Zion's watchmen where it cannot be seen that we are an international people. These questions were asked for righteous reasons. What position does the General Conference take regarding the war question? What proof they can bring that those that were disfellowshipped did not follow the biblical rule? What position does the General Conference take towards the testimonies? Because in Europe, they were not published. Conrad did not believe in the testimonies. And when they have read that they should pray that Germany should win the war, then they were asking, is our message national or international? Now I want to read the answer of Elder Daniels to these questions. And this is published in the book, Protocol, and I'm reading on page 30. As soon as the war began in Europe, we studied this subject carefully in America. Notice that the leaders of the General Conference, they were not ignorant of what was taking place in Europe. Because Elder Daniels here is declaring, as soon as the war broke out in Europe, we studied this point carefully in America. And on page 31, he says, we took the attitude that everyone should act in this matter according to his conscience. And further down, he says, then we had some brethren who had the spirit of love for their country and they went to the front and fought. They came to England and France and went into the trenches and I do not know what they did when they were there, but they served and returned when the armistice came. Notice Elder Daniels is saying that there were members of the church that they went they went to England and France, went to the trenches. Now, what was our position toward our brethren with their various attitudes? We have stated that we do not want to be conscious for other people. We declared our position as non-combatants. We are not concerned with going to war. We regret the war and are opposed to it, but we must allow every citizen to take his position toward the government according to his own conscience. Not one of these people has been disfellowshipped from our denomination. Not one of them has been treated as if he were not a Christian. Did you notice what happened to those that went to war? went to England, they went to France, they went to the trenches, and when they came back, none of them were disfellowshipped from the church. But who were disfellowshipped from the church? 
those that opposed the war service. After the explanation, and I'm not going to enter in the other points about the health reform and uh, the testimonies, but uh, I am going to talk only about our history on this point. So, Elder Daniels further declared the following on page 46 of protocol I read this Elder Daniels is saying we believe that you are completely in error in the views which you represent we believe in the fourth commandment just as much as we have always done but we are not in the position to agree with your interpretation of it. What would you have said about Moses if after the law had been given from Sinai, he had commanded you a few days later to kill the king of Bashan and all the men and women and children? Would you have accused him of murder? But God commanded him to transgress the sixth commandment. You see that there are many things to be found in the interpretation of the commandments and we must have liberty to read and understand the commandments and not to be bound to the way some small body may interpret them. This was the verdict of Elder Daniels. He stated that those that have been disfellowshipped because they were defending God's law, they were completely in error in the views which they were representing. Completely in error. Now our representatives were not satisfied with this and they desired to be heard by a higher authority. On page 43, Elder Daniel says, there is no higher authority, at the most a larger number of brethren. In our autumn meeting we will have a larger number of the brethren who will assemble together but it would only be a body of these members of the General Conference Committee. They said there is no higher authority to listen to you. We are the highest authority. We will be there. There may be more members, more brethren present, but representative of the General Conference, we will be the ones. And... The brethren, those that were disfellowshipped from the church, which were known as the 2%, or as they labeled us, the movement of the opposition, they were trying to present their cases to a general conference delegation session. But the work of them, of those that were disfellowshipped, progressed in Europe, especially in Germany, so that they had so many members that in 1919 they organized a union. But the name reform movement did not yet exist in 1919. They organized a union in Germany under the name of Seventh-day Adventists standing on the old platform of 1844 and the word reform movement was not yet used. In 1920 
to a delegation session of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was to be held in San Francisco, California. And those representatives that were defending the ancient faith of Adventism decided to send two representatives to San Francisco. And they arrived to San Francisco. And now here I want to open a parenthesis. When they arrived to San Francisco, who went to meet them at the port? Some followers of Margaret Rowan. But they did not know Margaret Rowan. Now, who was Margaret Rowan? You can read her history in the encyclopedia of the Seventh-day Adventists. She was a false prophetess that claimed to be the successor of Ellen White. And she had a strong follower and cooperator, Dr. B. E. Fulmer. He even was preaching false doctrine. Dr. Fulmer was preaching that the 144,000 will be made up only of American people. And as a result of that, Ellen White says, we should keep silence on this question. We should not enter in controversy to say who will be among that people. But the representatives of Margaret Rowan went to meet the representatives of the 2% in San Francisco. And because they had some uh, association with them, because they met them, we are labeled in the United States that we are followers of a false prophetess. But there is nothing of the kind. We have never followed Margaret Rowan. But what could our representatives do if her followers went to meet our brethren? When they arrived to San Francisco, they wrote a letter to the delegation on May 11, 1992. It is a long letter. I'm not going to read. But in this letter, they asked for an interview with the delegation. And they showed in this letter the reasons why. They were disfellowshipped. They were representing thousands of people. And they want to discuss the points that were given up by the Seventh-day Adventists in Europe especially. And they waited from May 11 until May 18 and received no answer. So on May 18, they sent another letter asking again if they will decide to give them an audience. And this letter of May 18, 1922 was not answered either. On May 22nd, four days later, they have sent a very short letter. Now, because this is short, I'm going to read this short letter. Elder A.G. Daniels, General Conference, San Francisco, California. Dear Elder Daniels, 
after several appeals for a hearing before the delegates of the general conference in session in regard to the questions of conscience as put forth in the enclosed open appeal have remained unanswered we at this time take again the liberty to ask you to be kind enough to give us at least an answer of yes or no to our many appeals with best regards we are your brethren in Christ Jesus signed Otto Welp this letter very short letter was not answered either until May 24 when Elder Daniels verbally gave an answer to the representatives of the 2% stating that these things cannot be permitted to come before the delegation and so they did not have any chance to present their cases or the cases the cases of thousands of souls in Europe they had no chance to present the problem so what to do they had to return back to Europe and report to the brethren what had transpired and then they had a conference meeting in Germany in 1922 and then in that conference they for the first time used the name reform movement however they still waited another year and in 1923, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist European Division had a meeting. And in that meeting in 1923, they made a declaration. The Council of the European Division made a declaration in 1923 and I'm going to read it. It was published later in the Review and Herald, March 6, 1924. And this is their decision. We grant to each of our church members absolute liberty to serve his country at all times and in all places in accord with the dictates of his personal conscientious conviction did you notice what was permitted to every person was given liberty of conscience to serve the country at any time, anywhere, according to what his conscience will say. What about if someone had a bad conscience? And the bad conscience says, yes, I have to go and I have to take up arms and I have to kill. According to their decision, that would be all right. But is that in harmony with God's word? Let me read a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 634. Patriarchs and Prophets, 634. God has given men no liberty to depart from his requirements. The Lord had declared to Israel, Ye shall not do every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, but... Ye shall observe and hear all these 
words which I command thee, in declaring upon any course of action, we are not to, to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. God has never given man permission to transgress his law. We believe in freedom of conscience, yes, but to do good. But freedom of conscience to do evil and to disobey, God has never given that permission. In Mount of Blessings, pages 51 and 52, we read, Were men free to depart from the Lord's requirements and set up a standard of duty for themselves, there would be a variety of standards to suit different minds and the government would be taken out of the Lord's hands. The will of men would be made supreme and the high and holy will of God, his purpose of love toward his creatures, would be dishonored, disrespected. Whenever men choose their own way, they place themselves in controversy with God. They will have no place in the kingdom of heaven, for they are at war with the very principles of heaven. In disregarding the will of God, they are placing themselves on the side of Satan, the enemy of God and man. And in great controversy, page 522, we read, By the cry, liberality, men are blinded to the devices of their adversary, while he is at all time working steadily for the accomplishment of his object. As he succeeds in supplanting the Bible by human speculations, the law of God is set aside and the churches are under the bondage of sin while they claim to be free. Liberty of conscience to do evil was not granted by God. Never. However, in the European Division Council meeting, this is what they decided to grant freedom, liberty of conscience, to transgress God's law. When the brethren of the reform movement saw that again it was given permission to transgress God's law, then they communicated between unions for at that time there were already other unions in Europe organized by those that were disfellowshipped from the church. But they did not have any idea of starting a new movement, a separate, organized, worldwide movement. They did not have that in mind. But when they found out that such a decision was made in 23, then they called for a meeting for the year 1924. And in 1924, they decided that in order to carry on the work of God successfully, they should be organized. And therefore, they called for a meeting for the year 1925. And that meeting in 1925 took place at Gotha, Germany, from July 14 to 20. 
1925. And in that meeting, our church, Seventh-day Adventist reform movement was organized. And the principles of faith and church order was prepared and approved in that meeting, the first general conference session of the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement. In the foreword of the principles of faith, it is stated, as distinction from the many branches of Adventists, we call ourselves, corresponding with the testimonies, the Reform Movement. Our name, therefore, is Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. From 1925, from the time of the first general conference session, this is our denominational name. Now, one point which I must make clear. Our name is not hyphenated, Seventh Day, but we use two separate words, Seventh and Day with capital D, Adventist Reform Movement. And this Reform Movement, after they organized, they found out that there was a prophecy about the commencement of the Reform Movement. And I will read that part, which is found in Testimonies to Ministers, page 515. You remember we have read page 514 when Ellen White made an appeal to begun, to begin a work of thorough reformation. Now, on page 15, in the same letter sent to the General Conference in 1913, she says this, I have been deeply impressed by the scenes that have recently passed before me in the night season. There seemed to be a great movement, a work of revival going forward in many places. Our people were moving into line, responding to God's call. My brethren, the Lord is speaking to us. Shall we not heed his voice? Shall we not trim our lamps and act like men who look for their Lord to come? The time is one that calls for light bearing, for action. The servant of the Lord, in 1913, declared that she was impressed deeply by the scenes that was shown to her. And then she said, there seemed to be a great movement. And our people were moving into line, responding to God's call. So the last call for reformation, made in 1913, now was answered. And Ellen White saw this in vision. In 1925, therefore, Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement became an organized body, a general conference of Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. And then from Europe, missionaries were sent to different parts of the world. 
to South America, to North America, to Africa, and today the reform movement is established already in 84 countries. We cannot boast ourselves of a large number of membership. No, we are still a small church. We are few in numbers. We are unpopular. We are poor in means. But we have something. We maintain Seventh-day Adventist doctrines. We have no new doctrine. And we did not intend to be separated. But what could we do? We, would, we were disfellowshipped. However, we find out that there was prophecy about the existence of the reform movement. In 1936, our General Conference was dissolved by the German police. Our goods were confiscated. And the only thing that they could save, according to a personal testimony of one man that told me personally, that was present at the time, the only thing that they could save were some documents for the files and one typewriter. And they had to move the headquarters from Germany to Switzerland in 1936. Three years later, World War II broke out. And in that World War II, Seventh-day Adventists, they took part in war as combatants, as many documents show, especially in Germany. They had to salute with the German salute. And what about the reform movement? Many of our brethren were martyred. They sealed their faith with their blood. During World War, many were killed because they would not transgress God's holy law. All through the ages, denial and persecution have been the fate of Christianity. This was the experience of Jesus himself. Therefore, we should not be surprised when his humble followers have the same experience. We, the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement, went through a terrible time of persecution during World War II. The names and photographs you see are from the book entitled, And Follow Their Faith, available from our office. These are some of many who were imprisoned, tortured, and killed because they would not break the Sabbath and would not bear arms in support of Hitler. They had to part from their family and loved ones who would often never see them alive again. Often they wrote letters encouraging their dear ones to be faithful so they could meet again when Jesus comes. They were beaten, whipped, starved, thrown into freezing water or vats of chemicals, beheaded, shot, buried alive, or executed in the gas chambers. How many faithful believers in the reform movement fought for truth under such deep suffering and pain 
during this period. How many tears were shed by mothers when they knew that their sons were buried alive in the concentration camps and they finally received the news of their death. These mothers knew that their sons had not died in the way they were told they did, but that they had been tortured to death. All these sufferings could be borne only through the strength of God's power. These faithful brethren suffered and died in defense of God's law, knowing that one day they would receive a crown of glory. Today we have been entrusted with the torch of truth. The church of today has the mission of bearing a message of warning and reproof to the world. What will we do if bearing this torch requires us to suffer and to die as these martyrs did? Paul says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Even after that, after the war was over, and when the communism took over the Eastern European countries, the reform movement was working underground. They were persecuted. Nearly all brethren have been in prison because of their faith. There were mainly two points the military service and not sending children to public schools on the Sabbath. And for that reason, they suffered strong persecution. Notwithstanding, the truth advanced. And we thank God because He has revealed to us truth that none of the people of the past centuries had known. We have our Bibles and the spirit of prophecy and our faith, our doctrines are based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. This is our history. After World War II, the General Conference was moved to the United States, originally established in the state of California, in Sacramento, and that registration was made in 1949 and we still have that registration up to this day but because of convenience that property was sold and the general conference headquarters was moved temporarily just for a very short time to Los Angeles and from Los Angeles was transferred to Blackwood, New Jersey. From New Jersey, the General Conference was transferred to Roanoke, Virginia, where we have now the headquarters of the General Conference. We are not concerned so much about quantity, but of quality. And we pledged ourselves to defend God's law 
and we pledged ourselves to be faithful to God, to the truth that was revealed to us in the word of God and in the spirit of prophecy. For any further information, we request you to contact our headquarters, General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement, P.O. Box 7240, Roanoke, Virginia, 24019. And it's my desire that the Lord may bless you and be acquainted with our history, be acquainted also with our doctrines and the prophecy of the Reform Movement. And may God bless you all. Amen.